Hi, and welcome to the District Architecture Center and this series on the giants of Washington architecture. If you haven't been to Washington recently, you may think its architecture is all classical government buildings and center hall colonial houses. And that's a really outdated image of Washington. In the 21st century, in fact, DC is one of the most vibrant cities in America. The changes happening in the city are breathtaking to those of us who live here, but they aren't happening by some fluke. They're happening because a lot of people worked really hard to get us here. Right outside our doors on 7th Street in the 1990s, this was a really dismal, empty street. Now it's one of the liveliest spots in the city. All those people who were willing to take a risk on downtown, who believed in Washington, we owe them. And so to paraphrase Isaac Newton, we have a great city today because we are standing on their shoulders. That's what this series is about, those visionaries and risk takers who believed in this city when it wasn't particularly fashionable or cool to do so. They made it possible for this city to thrive. We're starting off our series with Hugh Newell Jacobson, the great master of modern residential design. It's always been curious to me that somebody like Jacobson, who studied at Yale University's School of Architecture with Louis Kahn, one of the great 20th century modernists, would not only end up in Washington, but it would have this wildly successful decades-long career here. We're gonna look at several examples of his work, mostly in Washington. The first of which is this Georgetown Row House, which he remodeled. He completely revised the interior and added a bit to the front facade. Though expanded, the front of this house continues the scale, rhythm, and proportion of the historic Georgetown Street. Jacobson is famous for saying, architecture is like a well-mannered lady. It shouldn't shout at its neighbors. And the front of this house only gives the barest hint of being different. Its facade is wider, its windows are a little bit bigger, but it's a balanced design in keeping with the character of the neighborhood. The rear facade, however, is entirely glass and open to the garden. And Jacobson's architecture isn't about typical residential details. From the back, you can really see this. He creates spaces using volume and light. And while Jacobson has done many houses over his very long career, he's perhaps best known for the Monopoly House, a pared down idea of a house at once comfortable and starkly modern. He uses a simple gable roof, sometimes oversized, sometimes repeated, such as in this house that he called the three-linked pavilions. Just by looking at the front yard, you can see how playful his forms are. Using a leftover lot in a Washington neighborhood, Jacobson created a series of four structures linked by a deck. The simple house shape of the structures maintains the scale of the existing neighborhood. The staggered massing relates to a property line and a really steep grade change at the end of the property. All those views are pointed inward from the street, and so that's a really nice oasis of calm in the middle of a neighborhood. Now this was actually the place where all the other builders in the neighborhood dumped their dirt. So it was really the worst lot in the neighborhood. And look what he does. He creates one of the most spectacular houses in the city. Architect Richard Williams, who recently renovated the pavilions, likes to talk about their lightness of spirit. Modern architecture, he says, sometimes takes itself so seriously and how refreshing it was to work on a property that has such a sense of humor. And that's what people talk about when they describe Jacobson's work, how he's playing with form. You can really see it in this other example where he's exaggerated the proportions of the amazing Buckwalter House, which was built in 1982. This is from Eastern Pennsylvania and uses a regional style called the Telescope House because it's added onto over many years. He abstracted and expanded this form to this incredible shape. And this house was featured in nearly every architecture magazine and book on modern houses in the early 1980s. Beyond houses, Jacobson also did some serious preservation work. This is the Renwick Gallery when it opened in 1972 and it was one of his first restorations. Now, have a good look at this. You don't see anything particularly playful here. It's incredibly respectful of its original author. Likewise, his addition to the West Terrace of the United States Capitol building in 1993 created much needed conference space long before the visitor center on the east side was contemplated. The new structures are woven in, deft, careful, understated, and don't compete in any way with the historic architecture. Now, by 1998, Jacobson has really got quite a stature as an architect. He's had amazing commissions like the US Capitol and designed homes for some of the most famous people in the world. Even so, when Life magazine asked him to design a house for a typical family that could be built for $200,000, he took on that challenge. 
The house included everything they needed, a living room, dining room, kitchen, garage, four bedrooms, and two baths. The plans could be bought for a mere $550, and about 84 of these houses were eventually built. One element that you might find in any of Jacobson's projects is a very particular bookcase. He was quite fond of designing rooms around book collections and made the proportions of the bookcase so that the books could be rearranged if needed. One shelf's worth of books could easily be lifted by the homeowner and rearranged without too much trouble. Even in our increasingly digital world, these bookshelves look amazingly new and as fresh as the day he designed them. Finally, Jacobson was always thinking about how his buildings would work over time, how the weather affects the project, and how the occupants feel within it was always a consideration. Energy consumption and climate change are big issues in architecture today, but Jacobson was already considering those issues from its earliest projects. How has Jacobson's work translated into today? Without question, any architect who does modern residential design owes a debt to Jacobson. Architects who are winning local and national awards today in Washington are Robert Gurney, David Jameson, Mark McInturf, and Richard Williams, just to name a few all have learned from Jacobson and given the modern house their own spin. These architects in turn are influencing still younger architects in their firms and through their published work. Thus, Jacobson's influence will be with us for a long time to come. He believed in the modern house and that's what he did. He didn't follow every architectural fashion. He created his own architectural language and stuck with it. Throughout his amazing career, he stayed true to a commitment to modernism even when it wasn't in style. That kind of commitment in itself is an amazing story. Thank you for joining me on this short exploration of Jacobson's work. If you'd like to learn more about him, there are some resources appearing on your screen right now. And if you'd like to learn more about Washington architecture in general, please feel free to drop by our galleries on 7th Street at the District Architecture Center. You can also pick up a copy of our free quarterly magazine, Architecture DC. Until our next episode, thanks so much.